Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 26th of the COVID Calls, a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. Today on COVID Calls, how will COVID-19 shape the government, and can the government learn from the pandemic? My guests are Tom Berkland, Rob DeLeo, and Kristen Taylor. These calls are held every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and I serve as the host for these discussions. We are streaming on YouTube Live. The link to this discussion can be found at the Scott Knowles YouTube channel, or you can email me, or probably best to find me on Twitter, at US of Disaster. Please do help spread the word about the COVID calls, send suggestions for guests and topics, and please do feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. You can also hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts. Just go to soundcloud.com and search for the Slow Disaster Podcast or COVID Calls Podcast. Tomorrow, I am delighted to bring Kathleen Tierney, former director of the Natural Hazards Center, onto COVID Calls. She's the author of countless articles, important reports, many books, including The Social Roots of Risk, Producing Disasters, Promoting Resilience. Kathleen Tierney is a researcher's researcher, a real inspiration uh, to us in the social science disaster research community, and I hope you will join us for that important discussion tomorrow at five o'clock. As of today, there are 2,447,920 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 2,214,861 cases Friday. 766,664 of those cases are in the United States, up from 683,786 Friday. There are now a total of 41,313 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 34,575 reported on Friday. One of the most commonly held beliefs that I run into when I look at modern disasters in the United States is a very widely held notion that the government will certainly learn from disaster, that there are teams of experts ready to investigate, make reports, and hand those off to waiting policymakers, an assembly line. Certainly, the investigators are there. The shelves are full of investigative reports and committee hearings and draft legislation. But in reality, the pathway from disaster to learning to policy is an indirect one, sometimes a torturous one, sometimes it's a dead end. It's not that nothing is learned, but the impact on the government can seem erratic. I wanted to talk about the ways that COVID-19 is itself a reflection on the US government and also how it might reshape our government and understand a bit that pathway from disaster to learning to policy and governance. So this week I have experts coming from different fields, political science, sociology tomorrow and law on Wednesday to help me understand some of these issues more deeply. Let me introduce my guests for today's discussion. Thomas Berkland is a professor of public policy in the Department of Public Administration at North Carolina State University. His research has focused on how natural disasters and technological disasters influence policy change. He is the author of multiple books, including After Disaster, Agenda Setting, Public Policy and Focusing Events, and Lessons of Disaster, Policy Change After Catastrophic Events. Rob DeLeo is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at Bentley University. His research explores the political dynamics of agenda setting and policy change, as well as the governance of risk, hazards, and crises. His 2016 book, Anticipatory Policymaking, When Government Acts to Prevent Problems and Why It Is So Difficult, examines policy change in anticipation of emergent hazards including pandemic influenza, the various risks associated with novel technologies, and climate change. Kristen Taylor is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Wayne State University. Her research investigates the policy process, focusing events, policy failure and learning, and the politics of hazards and disasters. Dr. Taylor's current research compares how natural disasters and infrastructure failures can initiate policy learning about mitigation and resilience in local government. Her work has been published in a variety of venues, including Policy Studies Journal, Administration and Society, and Review of Policy Research. So you can see 
we have three real experts in how policy is made today. Tom, Rob, and Kristen, welcome to COVID Calls. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to start the way I have been with these, which is to uh, ask the guests how things are actually going where they are. Um, so with that in mind, Kristen, if I could start with you, you're in Detroit, right? Could you tell us a little bit about what the situation is there? I am, Wayne State is in Detroit. I live just outside Detroit. Um, we have sort of a fractured uh, experience in our community uh, in terms of, uh, how different parts of the city of Detroit and different parts of Wayne County are experiencing the pandemic. Um, so for a, a few isolated zip codes in the city of Detroit, they're feeling the, the effects of the pandemic really acutely. And that's put a big drain on resources. There was an article in the New York Times today about how the police force in the city of Detroit is really overwhelmed um, because they have so many, uh, so many officers who are, who are sick um, with the virus. So that's been a problem. And then, um, Michigan overall as a state is one where the city of Detroit is a major metropolitan area, but we have lots of rural areas um, and lots of recreational sort of tourist areas where Michiganders go for vacation or have second homes. And so the state government has been really concerned about Metro Detroiters leaving Detroit and going to their second homes and putting a drain on small hospitals that don't have a lot of capacity to, to handle a lot of COVID patients. So um, I think that the mood and the sentiment here is that things are not getting any worse, but things certainly aren't very good. And that's definitely divided by race and class. Are you teaching online right now? I am. I am. I'm just wrapping up the semester, okay. which has been, um, it's been hard on, it's been hard on the students. They didn't sign up to take, to teach an online class and, um, it's been a transition. So a lot of, uh, empathy and patience on everyone's part has has gotten us through. Now, Rob, you're in Massachusetts, right? I am. I am. Uh, my Bentley University is in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is about uh, seven miles outside of Boston. And um, how are things going? Well, we woke up yesterday to a front page Boston Globe story saying that the feds were now looking at Boston and, and Massachusetts more broadly as the emerging hotspot for COVID-19. Um, I think at the moment we have about 1,400 deaths um, in the state, another 34,000 uh, cases. Um, we're pretty consistently it been in like the top five states for, for cases and deaths. And similar to what Kristen was talking about, we have a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of disparities in the state. So um, Chelsea, uh, which is a densely populated working class um, Latino community, um, right outside of, of Boston, about, about a third of the COVID-19 tests coming out of Chelsea, Massachusetts are, are, are positive. Um, so we're seeing very similar trends to what Kristen just described um, in Detroit. Um, on the policy front, there are some exciting developments. Uh, just this week, uh, excuse me, at the end of last week, uh, our governor, Charlie Baker, uh, announced a COVID-19 uh, community tracing project. So he's going to enlist uh, about a thousand uh, public health students and medical students to engage in uh, a pretty ambitious community tracing project where everyone who tests uh, positive in the state of Massachusetts uh, will have will have community tracing in and around them. Uh, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. But but the overall numbers uh, in Boston are, are pretty sobering at the moment. Tom, to you, you're in Raleigh? Yes, indeed I am. I'm in Raleigh um, in Wake County, the uh, second largest metropolitan area in the state of, of North Carolina. Uh, our metropolitan area consists of several counties. Um, our county alone had uh, 599 uh, reported cases. Um, uh, the largest county in the state by population and the largest metropolitan area is Charlotte and Mecklenburg County with about 1,210 cases according to numbers assembled by the News and Observer in Raleigh, which is, shares this data with the Charlotte Observer. They're, they're kind of the same paper. Uh, 199 deaths in the state so far, which uh, seems uh, like a low number um, compared to some states. Um, 
I think the death rate in the state has been really low. The one thing that I've been watching, and I know a lot of other people have been watching, is the degree to which the caseload overtaxes hospital capacity. And that's always been the, the discussion. And like uh, a lot of people, um, I've been watching the, the data out of that, uh, I think it's IMHE out of the University of Washington, which is looking at, you know, the curve and looking at, you know, sort of flattening the curve and then keeping the curve under your critical sort of uh, healthcare um, number. So I think in my state probably looks a little bit more like California and Washington state than it does um, uh, Massachusetts or, or Michigan. Although um, I think we're, we're seeing the peak of the curve uh, maybe a little bit later than they saw it in, uh, mm -hmm. in California and, and Washington state. Um, you know, our state took fairly stringent uh, measures at the statewide level, what, three, four weeks ago. Um, you know, there's been a pushback a little bit like there are in all states now, it seems, about people who don't want to, um, you know, or want to ease the restrictions and uh, don't know quite what to make of that yet. I mean, I think there's some heartfelt um, you know, belief that maybe this, you know, the restrictions are too stringent, maybe in some areas they can be, um, or, um, you know, um, relieved, but there's probably also something going on um, at the level of sort of political ideology that would, requires a lot more investigation and, and, and um, in, you know, uh, understanding right now that I haven't gotten into yet. Um, but, um, uh, you know, if you look at the, 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 the modeling from various places, uh, we should start to see a downtick in, in deaths by uh, next week. Um, but that's based on a set of models that, you know, the, the assumptions are moving targets. So we don't know where we are yet. Yeah. I'm impressed always when I have guests on who are there's, you know, more than one, the varieties of experience that people are seeing in, right. in different states. And we're going to come to that, certainly, when we talk about federalism. Let me jump right in on the sort of discussion of policy and tunnel and start with with you, I mean, you're the author of, of books that I wish I could reach behind me and yank one off the shelf. I should have planned, I should have planned better, but uh, after disaster in 19, 1997, and then lessons of disaster also, just really fundamental books, I think for anybody who, who tries to make sense of the relationship between disaster and government. And in after disaster in 97, you, you picked up this concept of the focusing event. It was already out there but you really wanted to deconstruct it and find a way that it worked in very particular kinds of settings, I think, to really actually show how it, how it led to disparate outcomes, which I think is a really right. important part of this, maybe to make it less of a blunt instrument. And I, I wanna start with that because I wanna think about the focusing event in the context of the pandemic, but let's start maybe with you know, how you, why you picked that concept up, why it was important to you, how you applied it, right. and, and also why you felt like you needed the concept at that time in the late 90s, what was going on that sort of right. pushed you in that direction? Well, after disaster was not growth of my dissertation at the University of Washington. I studied under Peter May, who's a, a well-known public policy process uh, scholar. And at the time, um, what I wanted to do was write something about the Exxon Valdez oil spill. People who know me know that I grew up in Alaska. I grew up in Anchorage. And uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in 1989, not long before I started graduate school. And it annoyed me, as it did a lot of people, that this you know, oil spill happened and it was bothersome. And I, you know, I started out by this, you know, I was going to write this, this uh, study of you know, internal resource colonialism and the resource curse in Alaska or something like that, which didn't really fit. And that wasn't really Peter's uh, sort of thing anyway. And then uh, in a graduate seminar in the public policy process, we read uh, John Kingdon's book, Agendas, Alternatives, and Public Policies. And he introduces this notion of what we now call the, the the streams metaphor of the public policy process that when politics, policies, and problems come together in a window of opportunity, um, you know, policy change, well, agenda change happens, and policy change may be more likely to happen. Um, what um, what. Kingdon argued is that policy windows tend to open up because of either a change in indicators of, you know, of, of a problem like, you know, uh, say the teenage pregnancy rates or, you know, or um, opioid addiction rates or something or a focusing event, a big event, right? Mm -hmm. And he didn't define it very well. So I defined a potential focusing event as an event that's sudden, rare, harmful, or reveals potential future harms. And, um, and it's known by elites and, and mass publics virtually simultaneously. And if people are paying close attention, you're probably already seeing that this, that this COVID thing may not really fit 
that definition of, of uh, focusing event. It looks more like indicator driven policy, which is work Rob's done because um, elites knew more about, you know, this, this um, upcoming COVID problem. Uh, and we're talking about it more than we're say to mass publics. It didn't hit the you know journalism at exactly the same time. Like you have an Exxon Valdez or a Northridge earthquake or a, um, a Hurricane Sandy or something like that. And those hit all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to do in this book was then try to understand what is it about these events that make them focal? And I was trying to say, does it because it affects a lot of people? And that's not necessarily what makes them focal. The simple story is what makes them focal is the amount of damage they do, uh, met metaphysical damage they do, especially natural disasters in terms of um, of, um, of deaths and property damage. Um, I one of my case studies was nuclear power plant accidents, and the problem there was, and this is an interesting finding, was that the nuclear power policy domain was so politically polarized that events didn't really have that big of an effect except on the agenda it just people tended to take that of that event and and tell a story about it that that sort of reified their own position so pro-nuclear said look the system worked T tmi didn't melt down and the anti-nuclear is like whoa but it really came close um oil spills a little bit different where the oil companies kind of um sort of disappeared from public testimony about the oil spill for a while. E.E. E. Schatzneider, a very famous political scientist, called that, uh, you know, uh, restricting or constraining the scope of conflict, right, and restricting it instead of broadening it out, which is what environmental groups try to do. So that's where after disaster came from. It's well suited to sudden sort of out of the blue events. Um, one of the ones, and I'll finish on this thought, one of the, the domains I didn't study that I wanted to study, but would have, I think, neatly segued into some of this lessons learning stuff that I wrote in, in Lessons of Disaster was mm -hmm. aviation safety. Mm -hmm. um, aviation safety has long been considered to be an event driven domain that you have an airplane that crashes. You know, why did it crash? Well, they flew into a wind shear or the, the, the center fuel tank blew up and maybe we should, you know, fix that problem. Or um, there's a, a, a systemic problem with the rudder in the 737, even before the 37 Max, right? So you get all these things, right, that happen at an event, at a time, at a place, uh, it's really easy to fix in time. And then uh, that accumulates experience over time and, and to the point where now civil aviation is, is safer than it's ever been um, after being very, very safe before, right? So that would have been an interesting thing to study. I bring that up because that contrasts sharply with what we have now, which is it's happening everywhere, not in just one place. Right. It was indicator driven. And, um, I, you know, is this a focusing event? Yeah, probably. But the question is, what is it we're focusing on? And that's the big uh, question I have going forward as we study this. Mm. I wanted to just follow up a little bit about that, the Valdez in that late 90s mm -hmm. moment. I mean, how were the politics, let's just focus on the parties for a second. How was party politics functioning differently then than now, let's say, when it comes to dealing with with disasters and, and crafting a new legislative agenda. Can you generalize about that? I mean, I could say that, that, that uh, you know, we know empirically that, that partisanship or polarization wasn't as strong in 1989 as it was in, in uh, the mid nineties and into the two thousands and into now. Um, and I can also say that the solutions to the, the problem were, were uh, the, 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 the the solutions that were hit upon for the Exxon Valdez oil spill involving things like double hull tankers and, you know, having tugboats escort the ships out of Valdez Harbor and things like that um, were um, almost uh, the differentiation was more institutional than it was partisan that, that members of the United States Senate, for example, wanted to keep state level liability regimes in place for oil spillers, whereas members of the House wanted to have kind of a uniform uh, national system of liability regimes because of the nature of the people they were representing and, you know, the way that interests expressed themselves in the two institutions. Um, what resulted from the Exxon Valdez was, was compromised legislation. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, nobody got everything they wanted. Mm -hmm. But I will say that there's been no major vessel borne oil spill in American coastal waters uh, since 1990, since 1989. Now there was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which is a different sort of uh, uh, matter, um, but um, and that goes to offshore drilling, which led to its own sort of policy changes. Um, but um, the um, it, it would be interesting to see what the the outcome of the Exxon Valdez would have been 
uh, say now in a period of partisan uh, polarization, although I'm not sure it would have been much different because um, this wasn't a sort of a partisan valence sort of issue the way a lot of other issues are. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID Calls and we're talking today with Rob DeLeo, Tom Berkland, and Kristen Taylor. Please do get your questions in to the YouTube live chat or you can get the questions into Twitter. Just tag me at US of Disaster. Kristen, I want to come to you and think about this pandemic. Um, you know, when people talk about failure of government, and they do a lot, even when there isn't an obvious failure of government, I mean, that's one of the prerogatives of a democracy is we're allowed to talk about that all the time, and we do. Um, but when, when you hear that discussion today, and the failure of the government, where do you focus? I mean, you know, I sometimes wonder, are we, is it that the, the laws that we have are not the right laws, the, the bureaucracy that we have is not the right bureaucracy, or the people that we have in there are not the right people, mm -hmm. and I'm not forcing you to choose A, B, or C, but maybe take us into this a little bit when, you, when we think about government failure, where should we be looking? So there are two sort of different ways of thinking about this um, from a scholarly and academic perspective. And the first is that we can think of the preparedness and the response um, and the sort of the uh, policies that were in place to prepare and get ready for a, a pandemic outbreak. Um, if the, those policies themselves were flawed, academically, we'd consider that a policy failure, right? There was something wrong in the design, either the target population that we thought would be the ones most vulnerable or susceptible to, to a virus or to some sort of um, illness that they would be the behaviors that we would want to intervene and help uh, keep them safe. And so, so we can think about policy failure as one as being um, uh, flawed and being a source of learning, right? Maybe we didn't anticipate um, governing capacity or we didn't anticipate healthcare system capacity. And we designed policies that made assumptions that were really sort of uh, overstated or understated, either on what government and hospitals were able to do or um, or how people that we thought would be affected by the pandemic would behave. So that's sort of one way of thinking about it. And and we think that we can learn from that, like policy learning that ha happens after a failure like that is generally one where where we generate lots of lessons learned documents and we put reports on the shelves and we hope and anticipate that government will change their policies and retool them to be more effective and work in representative governance the way we want them to, that we think that we should in a representative democracy. Um, and then the other part of this that you sort of highlighted and touched on was government failure, government and governance failure. And I think when we think when we look at COVID nineteen and the and the response to that, I think that getting closer to thinking about governance failure, governance of the crisis at at every single level of government, I think is really um, I think that's the big uh, intellectual question for me out of this. Mm -hmm. So was it a failure at the federal level to really listen to what the CDC was saying and to listen to what the indicators were about the likelihood that there would be a pandemic outbreak in the United States? Was it the failure of the uh, governors and the, and the White House and the president and the federal government to work together and to coordinate their responses and to do so early on? Um, was it a failure to allocate resources in places that we kind of know instinctively there would be hotspots, right? Like that's a coordination and a governance issue that I think warrants some deeper investigation. Um, and then there's coordination and governance at the state and local level. So um, like I mentioned earlier in the state of Michigan, the ability for the governor and folks in Lansing to balance the needs of the city of Detroit mm -hmm. with needs for the rest of the state is really one where there requires lots of coordination and lots of cooperation. And so, um, the literature kind of it says that there are lots of different reasons why this could break down and the big one the big explanations are credibility so does the white house think that what the cdc is telling them is credible and are they willing to take on that information do, is the governor of the state of michigan does she find the the president and the white house to be credible in how they're approaching managing this crisis and managing this pandemic 
Um, and then how does that influence, you know, whether she believes the information they give her, whether she is willing to take it on and undertake their recommendations or not. And then that, you know, flows down the line. So credibility of who's sending the policy messages in these governance uh, situ in these governance matters and their capacity and willingness to take what other government actors are saying and then put it into action. Those are the big things that um, that I would expect when I look at this, when I sort of do like my my research on it as the as the dust settles. Those are the things that I'll be looking for. You know, credibility of actors involved, the information that they're sending, whether they, it was viewed as credible or not, whether the other actor govern govern actors governing the situation had the capacity, and so that's finance, that's willingness, that's organizational and professional capacity to do it, whether they had the means. So, um, one of the big things that sort of come out. Um, is that you know in terms of personal protective equipment for um, for local police officers and sheriffs and first responders is that local government agencies were sort of crowded out of buying and purchasing and getting access mm -hmm. to lots of PPE that the states would either crowd them out of or and then before that the federal government was crowding states out of that marketplace. So in terms of governance and making sure that people on the first lines really had the ability to do their job that seems like an like a real failure of governance to me like on at, at first blush so uh, that's a the new york magazine had a version of that story today and it's a remarkable story this idea that somehow the federal government is outbidding states um for medical um equipment that's that's needed i want to um just stick with you for a second on this because i've been really fascinated about the dynamic I'm always fascinated by this, but particularly now around governors. And, you know, I guess maybe you could explain the research a, a little bit here that, do, I mean, do governors thrive on moments like this? Do governors crave moments like this? I'm thinking of Chris Christie in Hurricane Sandy and his move where, you know, to the, the hug, the famous hug with Obama on the tarmac, yes, which I think showed an, an incredible, was an incredible political gesture, very, he knew what he was doing. He was sending himself, he was putting himself with the president and bringing this up in people's mind. This is a guy who's a governor, but he's a, he's a president. Um, is that, or am I just making too much out of this particular case? Because I'm really curious about how governors function in these moments. So, so I think that there are a few different things going on. And the first is that, you know, all disasters are inherently political events. And this is, um, and, I, and I have to cite Rutherford Platt, like he's the, his seminal work in this area that all disasters are inherently political events. That should be our tagline for COVID <laughs> call. I should have that on the screen at all times, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, all disasters are inherently political events. They're inherently political events. And I think that, I think that holds true for this. If you um, and as a scholar of federalism and intergovernmental relations, particularly with policy implementation in hazard mitigation, um, this is fascinating for me because um, federalism is working, right? It's working like when the when the federal government fails to do its job, states have have the capacity, they have the political and governing authority, they have the managerial and financial capacity, they have the discretion to step in and really meet the needs of their states. And from uh, uh, a, you know, being in a representative democracy, that's exactly what we want, right? Like we, this this would make the, this would make Alexander Hamilton, uh, well, no, he really liked the president. Um, this would make Thomas Jefferson really happy. Well, uh, along those lines, I mean, just real quick, one of the things I'd find heartening is that the governors are stepping up. And in fact, if you look at the public opinion data, the, the uh, people are trusting their governors more than they are trusting the president. And this goes back to sort of the mantra we've always said in disaster response, you know, natural disasters is that the federal government exists to suffer Supplement state and local efforts. It's you know, and we, we there's a, a turn you know because of the nationalization of news media, the nationalization of politics. We tend to think that the first mover always has to be the feds, but um, you're having state by state variation in the way that policies are being made, uh, and governors are making different decisions based on different facts on the ground, different political facts on the ground, and so you're going to get some variation. The, the, this notion that they're banding together, you know, the Oregon, Washington, California, the Midwest states are in one group. Um, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, and another. Um, you know, it it um, the the message I think that that um, 
that I, when people ask me federalism, it's alive and well. I mean, it's it's it hasn't disappeared. And in fact, there's a lot of reason to believe that this is going to strengthen federalism uh, at some level because people are going to see the disparate effects of of you know states that handle it well and then lay that against the uh, federal response, which has been uh, wanting. And to um, sort of to circle back to the politics, at least the partisan politics. If you contrast. Um, the state of Michigan and Governor Gretchen Whitmer with the state of Ohio and Governor Mike DeWine. So Whitmer is a Democrat, DeWine is a Republican, um, who have made very, very similar policy decisions in what in how they restrict and inhibit behavior. And if you look at like the timing of it, uh, Whitmer's executive orders come out about a day or two after Mike DeWine, uh, DeWine's executive orders, but she has been the one who's caught the flack. Uh, she's got the political flag from the White House. You know, she's that woman from Michigan. It's, you know, liberate Michigan, even though the state of Ohio with a Republican governor has a very similar right. uh, po profile and similar response in every single way. Um, and I think that that is multi-directional, right? Her her political retort to that is she's going to do what's best for the for the citizens of the state of Michigan. Right. Right. And so, um, and she's going to do it based on facts and data and science. And so, and that is, if you think about like the language of politics and the language of problem indicators, which is Rob's, you know, exp expertise, like how she's talking about it is completely, it's, we're going to talk about science and we're going to talk about data and we're going to talk about medicine and, and facts. And that like in the current political climate, that's political, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't think it would be. <laughs> like, this, right. we're gonna right. we're gonna ground right. decisions based on science. That's political to some right. people. So, right. um, so I think you know, I think that it's um, the political nature of this runs both ways, and um, it's just Rob. Thank you, Rob. Let me bring it to you. I mean, the title of your book, anticipatory policy making. So you you're a guy who thinks about preparedness, government's capacity to um, prepare for events and maybe even unexpected events. So take us inside that work a little bit and maybe your own sense of where the federal government was prepared here, where not. Um, yeah. And also state houses, you know, the, this disjunction, which we've been talking about now already around fair, federalism is really crucial on preparedness. Yeah, I think I, I, I actually think I have a slightly different take on on federalism um, than my colleagues here. I, I, I think what my work would suggest and what funding for these programs would suggest is, is that governors are really making lemonade out of lemons and structurally they were put in a position um, for a number of years now, that left them ultimately unprepared for this. Um, so to backtrack a little bit, you know, the first time I was introduced to uh, Tom's research, I was I was actually an undergraduate in a public policy class, um, and this was around 2003, 2004. Um, and my um, my professor wrapped up a detailed presentation of Tom's work on focusing events. Um, by concluding that when it comes to focusing events, um, we, we can't tell uh, whether or not a disaster constitutes an event until it's in our rear view mirror. So this idea that the disaster happens and then we retrospectively look back at what does it symbolize? Does it symbolize government failure? Was it just an act of God? And what does that mean? Well, right around that same time, um, we were in the midst uh, of a, a great amount of concern uh, about the possibility of the H5N1 avian influenza. And a lot of the language coming out of the White House, a lot of the language coming out of the United States Congress, um, it deviated from that reactive policy sequence that Tom characterized in his book. And it was, it was really focused on preparedness. We hadn't had a single H5N1 case in the United States, and yet, we had legislation that was being introduced uh, to uh, better prepare ourselves for the possibility of a pandemic. Um, we had various pandemic plans coming out of the White House uh, that were aimed at infusing money into states in order to allow them to do planning. Um, and we also had a president that was very concerned at the time um, with the possibility of uh, an emerging uh, hazard. And so, my research on anticipatory policymaking 
was really uh, an attempt to carve out a space for public health problems in the disaster policy literature. Because I think for a lot of us, these types of hazards uh, deviate quite sharply from the types of things we usually study. And so I think there's, in at least two respects, um, they differ from what Tom describes in his books. One um, is, is the way in which they revealed themselves, which is what Tom alluded to before. Um, these aren't things that are known simultaneously to the media and the public. They don't emerge without warning. Um, we usually have a, a period where we can pretty clearly see indicators, typically cases and deaths accumulating, uh, hopefully abroad, if not domestically, that suggest there's a looming problem. And if we don't ready for that looming problem, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create some serious problems for us. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, it's, it, it's very rare to have such long duration hazard events as well. Um, you know, when you look at the management of a hurricane, while the recovery might take quite a while, um, you don't have a situation where you have to deal with the actual hazard for, for an extended period of time as you do here. Mm -hmm. So politically, I, I always thought that that created a very different dynamic uh, than a, a post-disaster, post-focusing event uh, policy dynamic. And we're really seeing how that plays out now. Um, now, what I didn't appreciate uh, at the time I wrote my book, and I certainly you know, didn't appreciate even in the articles I published after my book, um, what was just how important those indicators are in driving uh, subsequent policy decisions. So if you were to look at uh, the failures in our response to this, uh, one of the greatest failures is, is our lack of surveillance, our, right. our consistent inability to track this virus. And really, um, th that failure was set up um, not when the first cases happened in Washington, but, but, but by the time the virus was already circulating Wuhan. And what is stunning is how slow uh, institutions of government were to pick up on these cases, respond to these cases, and begin to flag this as a problem that we should ready for. Um, almost the complete opposite of what we saw with H5N1. Uh, now, um, Kristen can speak to this as well, because we have a few projects going on right now that, that, that are examining sort of this broader structural idea of preparedness. But I would also add that even though we have those flashes of, of preparedness in, in the United States, by and large, we're an unprepared country. So if you were to look at investments in the public health and emergency preparedness program, which is really the, the, the primary source of funding for a lot of state uh, uh, programs on emerging diseases, the hospital preparedness program, we've been gutting those programs um, since after the swine flu pandemic. And so, it's not really a surprise to those of us who study preparedness that you know governors are in this position where they're having to scramble to get these resources because they've it's been chronically underfunded for for quite a while. Does that somehow let the the governors or even Trump off the hook a bit if what you're describing is a situation of structural disinvestment in in the signal beacon, if you will. I mean, that you're talking about surveillance or we're talking about the capacity. I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the analogy to climate change here. Um, and clearly we're at a point where policymakers have had enough signals for a while to begin a, a robust policy process as they've done in other, in other countries. But I do wonder, you know, that as the ability to sort of spot long range threats diminishes structurally, how much can we hold policymakers responsible for events? There's a sort of temporal lag here yeah. that I'm really interested in. I, let me open that up to in, yeah. any of you who want to talk about that, because I'm, well, I'm I, really worried about this sort of no I policymaker love... can in the moment can deal with all of the collected failures of the, of the government previously to build the structures we well, need. The idea of the signal beacon is a really, really important one. And I think this is where some of the blame gets laid squarely at the foot of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump 
since taking office has really systematically devalued data and the people in his administration who would be responsible for collecting that data. So Scott, here's a fun anecdote I, I think you'll appreciate about the lead up to H5N1. Um, the HHS secretary at the time, Michael Levitt, um, was consumed by the prospect of uh, a pandemic influenza. Um, in fact, uh, he was said um, to have bought uh, John Barry's book, The Great Influenza. He, he bought copies of it for everyone in Congress who sat on a committee with jurisdiction over global public health. He doggy-eared uh, those copies and he highlighted sections of the book that, that, that underscored the possibility of another pandemic influenza. You know, that type of policy entrepreneurship, which is some, something that all of us uh, study uh, that are on this call, is really critical to sort of stimulating concern within the legislative branch because they're not as privy to that data. And mm -hmm. so we would look in most public health crises like this where there needs to be a preparedness, a pre-pandemic period, we would look to the executive branch to, to initiate that. And at the time when that should have been taking place, the president was quite frankly, more concerned with assuaging investors that this was not going to affect uh, uh, the economy. Um, so I think that that signal beacon was un undoubtedly broken in this context. Um, but there, there were sort of a structural chronic underinvestments in preparedness that even if that signal beacon had been triggered sooner, while it could have made a difference, I don't believe it could have compensated for well over a decade of, of underinvestment in these programs. Tom or Kristen, you want to come in on, on this problem of sort of time lag and structural disinvestment? Uh, well, I can, I can speak a little bit to this pattern of structural disinvestment. Um, from a political science standpoint, we think that uh, voters don't reward their legislators for long-term investments in hazard preparedness. Really? Um, and and yeah, we they yeah. they reelect their legislators uh, based on the most recent last disaster, and they do it based on how much uh, relief money they got. Um, so uh, they tend to be short sighted, and they tend to uh, reward for relief and not preparedness. This is true of natural hazards, and it uh, without you know I would I would question. And it seems as if the pattern is also true for pandemic flu preparedness, pandemic, pandemic uh, illness preparedness, um, that we have the same sort of mechanism where we uh, voters reward legislators uh, by, you know, by the most uh, significant thing that they've done for them in the last three months. And, um, and there is no long term, there's no, uh, there's no political or electoral reward, uh, which is re-election, right? It's always re-election. There's no political reward for long-term preparedness. It's expensive. It tends to be politically unpopular, right? To say that you're going to um, limit development on every co beautiful coastal place where people go for vacation is really politically unpopular. Um, it limits uh, economic development through tourism and housing construction in, sure. in beautiful yet hazardous areas. Th those are the things that we think that political science think uh, we punish legislators and policymakers for doing for long term preparedness that would keep us safe at least in the context of hazards and the effects of climate change. But that's that's a structural feature of American politics. I mean, I think we've got to remember that, you know, the, the United States Congress, especially the lower house of Congress, the House of Representatives, is a remarkably efficient institution in the, um, the div devising, uh, dividing up the federal fisc and handing it out to states and, and to local um, jurisdictions. I mean, even, even um, in, in most cases, the most, you know, anti-government, anti-spending, you know, uh, fiscal conservative will still put a press release on or a, an announcement on their, their website or their newsletter for, to their constituents saying how they landed federal money for something that happened in their district. Um, disaster relief is incredibly politically popular. This is why, um, you know, uh, uh, 
President Clinton was so good at it um, in the 90s. Uh, it, many will remember that that um, FEMA was on its on, was on a very wobbly ground after uh, 1992, after Hurricane Andrew. Um, it was considered um, a very poor agency. Uh, one report called it the Turkey Farm because it's where third-rate political appointees were dumped. Um, and um, but James Lee Witt, of course, comes in. You know, knew Clinton turned the agency around. But one of the things they did is they invested in hazard mitigation. They created something called Project Impact. It was going to do a lot of hazard mitigation. One of the very first things that the uh, Bush administration did is got rid of Project Impact. They announced at the Natural Hazards Conference in Boulder that they weren't any more interested in you know sp uh, spending federal money on events that you know got a bunch of Cub Scouts together. And that was a more or less direct quote from the person who made that statement. Um, I'll spare that person the uh, the indignity of being uh, named and know who that was. But the, the point was that they just instantly said, no, to hell with it. We're just not going to do that anymore. We're just not going to spend money on. And, you know, th then there was this big hue and cry about, oh, you got rid of Project Impact. And then the Nisqually earthquake in Seattle happened in 2001. And everybody said, well, it would have been a lot worse had it not been for Project Impact, which is, you know, very hard to prove. But, um, you know, it, they went around and around. But, yeah, bottom line is that 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 a priori investment makes less political sense than a posteriori, you know, ex post um you know, spending, sending resources to a district. The problem now, of course, is that everyone's got it. And so you can't really differentiate between you know, who's getting the resources, who isn't. But then, you know, to wrap this comment, this set of comments up, um, you know, you have political explanations and structural explanations, right? And, you know, where they fit, I don't know. But I mean, the decision to, for example, reduce the number of CDC people in China, there's some controversy about whether or not having those CDC people in China would have made much difference in the end, you know, with, uh, with the Chinese, uh, with the, the way they handled it. But, um, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, defanged themselves in a way. Um, the strategic stockpile, you know, of, of all these things, and the the, the idea that the, the the federal government doesn't exist to support the states, but is basically just another market mover uh, with all the other states, and is in competition with the states for resources rather than you know supporting the states and getting the resources. Now, there's going to have to be a, a a lot of post disaster analysis to see how much of this is really swept up in just the politics of our time. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of polarization around, you know, Donald Trump. I think this goes back to Rob's point that, you know, I've been looking, you know, as a scholar, you know, trying to say, you know, how much of this can you really lay on the Trump administration? And, and the Trump administration, I think you can lay a fair bit on it because the Trump administration did not come in on a platform of managerial competence. In fact, they, they, they prize the level of managerial incompetence or non-competence, you know, so it just doesn't matter, you know, it, um, but there are structural things like the disinvestment that happened over the last 15 years, or um, perhaps, and I don't know, Rob could speak better to this than I can, or perhaps a belief that this is going to look more like SARS and MERS than it was going to look like what it does, right? And this isn't SARS. I mean, it, it has different characteristics. Um, and just behaves differently. And so you can't apply that template, which goes back to some of the things we talk about learning, you know, you're learning the right lessons. And uh, there's a whole body of, of literature on learning from history and, you know, whether or not that's, uh, that's accurately applied in this case. Um, there's a lot more work to be done on this, but we're, we're, as Rob said, in the middle of the disaster right now. And so there's no way we can look backwards to find out what's going on while we're in the midst of it. Well, we can, but it's gonna be inconclusive. Well, there's so many things I wanna pick up from that. I mean, one, just summing up some of what I've just heard is that in a sense, the government is giving the people exactly what they want. I mean, the biases that you were talking about, Kristen, are pretty striking, right? That, that the electoral reward for a policymaker to fix inherited structural deficiencies in our national preparedness, it just isn't there. So you would have to look for that in some other place, either external to the government in the private sector or in the media, let's say some other watchdogs or some, or in um, policy advocacy groups outside of the government. Um, we'd be looking for things other than the US Congress, what you said, Tom, you know, um, they're good at dividing up the, they're good at dividing up the, um, the relief bill, but beyond that, they're not gonna be, their policy horizon is gonna be, is gonna be very short. Having said that, um, I have a question for each of you, because I know this is on people's minds. What, you put your prediction hats on here. Political science is a predictive social science. So um, uh, history is not. 
um, where do you expect to see policy creativity during this? I mean, this is gonna last three years, folks. Or immediately as this is ending, wrapping up, you know, the next Congress or the next is gonna have COVID-19 on its, on its agenda. Maybe that's not the right place to look. Maybe the house isn't it. Look, Rob, let me start with you and let's do a sort of a quick round where each of you might sort of locate where we could expect to see policy response to this disaster. Or are you so pessimistic that I shouldn't even be asking that? question and I'm okay with that if that's true too. Well, I actually have a, yeah, I mean, I have a, a couple upshots here and um, Kristen's gonna get mad at me for talking about uh, a project that, that hasn't actually been published yet. Um, but Kristen and I actually had um, with our other co-author, um, Sarah Anderson at the University mm -hmm. of California, Santa Barbara, um, we actually surveyed um, voters and elected officials uh, over the course of the last year um, because a lot of uh, our assumptions about voter preferences around preparedness are largely based on studies of electoral outcomes. And so if, if voters aren't rewarding uh, policymakers for this activity, that must mean they don't care about it. And we're not at all discounting that. We believe that that's true. Um, but when we surveyed them, uh, what we actually found was uh, if, you, if you communicate disaster risks to voters by mentioning past losses in their state, um, they're, actually, they're actually quite interested in preparedness at times, much more than we ever expected. So before we sort of shut the door on the possibility of um, preparedness policy making, not only in the case of public health, but Scott, you also mentioned climate change, you know, climate resilience and adaptation is going to look an awful lot like, like public health preparedness from a political perspective. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think a big part of the problem is we really don't know how to message it all that well. And we don't know how to message it all that well, because unlike a lot of other domains in our political system, you don't have uh, an army of well-funded lobbyists that are sort of working on these strategies to make these pitches to policymakers. So here's the upshot. I would I would hope that the lesson learned from this disaster, and I'm not sure when we'll be ready to derive that lesson, Scott. I, I don't think it's gonna be this summer. I think it's gonna not happen until after the election and we're starting to see uh, a, a, a change in, in, in our current living situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I would hope one of the lessons will focus on the importance of, of, of being prepared. Of, of investing in preparedness, um, not just for this disaster, but others. And Kristen, I don't know if you want to pick up on, on some of the survey stuff. Uh, no, I think, I think you, I mean, I also was going to end on that. I was going to mention that upshot that a lot of, um, from our study that's out, that's manuscript that's in preparation and very close to going out and being under review. And I think, uh, our, I think our collaborator, Sarah Anderson would agree that, um, voter attention uh, to things like uh, long-term climate change preparedness is something that, uh, that the voters are paying attention to that um, and that they, uh, they want uh, legislators to spend more on long-term climate change preparedness is something that we didn't really expect to find. Um, and we know based on our study that when um, when voters are paying attention and legislators pay attention, that tends to change preferences for policy change for policy mm -hmm. outcomes or change. Uh, it changes their policy preferences that favor long-term preparedness. There's mm -hmm. no language. So, I think that's a real ray of hope for us that that voter attention to public health preparedness, uh, pandemic preparedness. Um, if it if if attention to it to to the preparedness side of it the long term preparedness side of it in terms of public health if that is sustained and that is something that we really value um, legislators and policymakers are going to follow that trend line and I think that's a real point of hope um, you asked about um, uh, about agenda change or you said the next Congress mm -hmm. this will be on Congress's agenda. Um, I'm a bit of a skeptic on that front um, mm. because I've read the work of Tom Berkland. Uh, and so I think that the, um, 
I think that the spatial and temporal and sort of uh, cross-cutting uh, effects of this um, may diffuse the power to the power of the pandemic to really mm -hmm. focus the agenda on one yeah. particular thing. And I think um, I think you know you know Tom's work on focusing events you know says that you know there's a community of interests that are affected by the disaster. And I think that the challenge here in terms of thinking about the effect of the pandemic on changing the policy agenda and promoting policy change that makes us more prepared for the next pandemic is that the communities of interest, there are far too many communities of interest that have been affected and they're far too diffused. Um, so I think that'll be the real challenge of like the, the, the power of this, hmm. of this event to change policy. That's exactly happen. right. Oh, and and, oh. and I, I think it's, I think it's because and, and, and picking up on what Kristen said, how do we what, if when we tell the story of this, is this a public health disaster? Or is it an economic disaster? I mean, and, and look, I mean, it's both right. Um, but uh, different interests are going to portray in a different way, right. And we know there's a there's a body of, of literature in in, in our field called the narrative policy framework and, and which argues that basically policymaking proceeds by the telling of stories right and so the question is what's your narrative frame right I mean is it is it about the economic effects going forward then the political um, I just saw a, a story flashed across my other screen here while we were talking that the governor of Georgia is about to start opening up things like hair salons and bowling alleys but not bars I'm like you know, I'm like, how many people are really going to rush to a bowling alley right now? But, but you know, is my question. But I, I think what that hints at, and it's something Rob and Chris and I talked about earlier today. Um, you know, we're going to have a slow relaxing of some of these restrictions over the summer, and and then I think what's going to happen is people are going to then see what does that look like in terms of the case rate. You know, in other words, how many more? You know, are we still staying under the curve? And the goal ultimately is not to overtax healthcare systems, right? That's the goal. That's why we want to crush the curve. The idea of crushing the curve. I think we're going to tolerate a certain amount of COVID uh, in and around and people getting sick um, as long as it doesn't overwhelm the, overwhelm the healthcare system, right? And as long as it doesn't just so overwhelm our ability to respond to it. Um, to get to that point, we're gonna have to have things like testing, maybe contact tracing, things like that. But I, I wonder if in, in, in the, these protests do tap into a vein that says this can't be like this forever. I don't that mean know if that means our schools all open up or our colleges all open everything, but um, you know loosening up some restrictions on like whether I can go to my local park and play tennis, you know, for example, or um, you know whether or not certain kinds of stores can be open and others can't be like, you know, some states have been restricting like in Michigan, for example, they said, you know, your, your plants and, you know, lawn care equipment section had to be closed off. Well, why? I mean, my neighborhood, that's all people have to do right now is work on their lawn. And so uh, right. and I say right. that facetiously, but we're all stuck at home, right? And so, right. Um, which, which makes me think that there's also going to be interesting sectoral differences in the economic impact that haven't been teased out yet. Everybody's hurting. Tourism is going to take a beating. Uh, my home state, Alaska, you know, it's going to have a terrible, I mean, you have a state where I'm at, you know, from, from, from Alaska, where, you know, the price of oil today, the future price for oil was $0 a barrel. And you couple that with no cruise ships showing up in Southeast Alaska, that's going to be a lot different impact than it's going to be somewhere else. So there's going to be, I think, and this goes back to the federalism and governors and local decision making about where to ease and where not to ease. And you're going to have some really interesting frankly experiments about what you can do and then the feedback will be public reaction to it one and two um you know whether or not it increases the the the, the number of cases of COVID again the last thought on that is a lot of these people are saying let's open things up have failed to take into account individual decision making where a lot of us even if they open the bars and hair salons we're not going right yet People's so go. there's a lot of things going on I mean, there's, there's something to me counterintuitive about the way that we're talking about this and about this, the focusing event, Tom, which, and that's right. counterintuitive, therefore fascinating, which is in a sense, if it's national, it's too diffuse. If it's over time, it's 
it's too diffuse. It doesn't match well to the way that our government can focus its attention in the near term on policy on policy solutions. So the thing that that but even just listening to you talk about how it might play out over 12 to 24 months is that it may very well devolve. In fact, I think in many ways it already has begun to devolve into a series of kind of regional disasters. In right. some cases, it's going to look like kind of like a hurricane might look with a devastation to the tourism industry. In other cases, it might be devastation, let's say, to, um, I don't know, you know, what other kind of sector? Well, obviously hospitals in rural areas. This is something people have really been, been worried about. So I'm not sure there's a, a, I have a clear question, certainly don't have a clear answer, but that again, this problem that we really haven't seen maybe enough research on a 50 state and five territorial disaster that literally activates every emergency operations center across America simultaneously just doesn't seem to fit well into any of the models that we have, does it? Well, and part of it is because it's not a natural disaster. It's a public health disaster. And so the, the application, like, for example, the invocation of the EOC, well, what's an EOC really going to do? Right? I mean, it might be a good place for people to have a meeting, but this is a public health issue. This is not about the physical destruction of property and, you know, the sort of physical, you know, damage to people, which is done by, you know, geophysical events, you know, like uh, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes. Um, so, um, you know, one thing along those lines, real quick, I was going to gather the data. I didn't have time today. A measure I used after 9-11 was to measure the half-life of an issue on the media agenda. In other words, how long does it take for there to be half the number of, of articles that were at the peak? You'd be surprised to learn that the half-life of terrorism as an issue in the United States on the national desk of the New York Times is about six weeks. It surprised me how short it was, right? Mm. I don't think it's going to be that short. With, with this. This is on the agenda. And you, you open up any local newspaper. I read local, I read the Seattle Times, Anchorage Daily News, the Raleigh News Observer, and it's front and center. And it's not going away. And that's what makes it different than, than, than a typical disaster, which tends to kind of, you know, we turn to something else over time. This is, uh, this is going to be with us a while. You know, so, the um, other thing I would sort of add there that we haven't really touched on is, is how is the presidential election going to affect the frame, right? Because it's going to be an election about yeah. COVID-19. And I think one of the my concerns as someone who hopes the lesson learned from this uh, focuses on preparedness is that um, if the Democrats were victorious in the fall, there will be so much framing of the issue as an outgrowth of Trump's President Trump's incompetence that that any focus on any other areas of change will get overlooked. So, so simply removing him from office is, is, is sort of the end game there is sufficient. And that would certainly change our response to others. But I think that there's, there's a risk in that political calculus. We're, we're coming up on time here a little bit. I want to just get a question in that came from uh, Cristobal Mena. And it does tap back into some themes we've been on for the last hour, but he's asking, are we paying enough attention right now to the cognitive bias of policymakers um, as a way to explain policy failures and gaps? And I had Howard Kunrother on last week and we talked a little bit about cognitive biases as well. And I think Kristen, you were telling us a bit about cognitive biases, maybe, or in, maybe it's not the right terminology, but you know, what motivates voters and, and what they're afraid of and what they're not what they're not afraid of. Um, can we, I mean, how do you analyze that? How do we change, can we, the cognitive biases or address the cognitive biases of our policymakers, possible? Oh. Anybody wanna take that? Uh, the first, I think the knowledge is, self-knowledge is the first step. I mean, I, I think a lot of the recent work on cognitive biases, you know, going back to Kahneman and Diversky, and, and I'm familiar with Howard Conrader's work, is that, you know, the first step is to know what the cognitive biases are. I was at a talk right after the election, the, the, the 2016 election in 2017, Theta Scotchpole, for example, who got up and said, everybody engages in motivated reasoning, right? And the people that are best at it are academics because we're really good at gathering evidence to make a point, to make the point we wanna make. And I've got JSTOR at my fingertips so I can go out and get the peer reviewed research to make my point. So, um, you know, the, the first step is to know 
but um, I, I, I don't know if anybody's done this. Um, I know the political scientists use things like prospect theory, uh, you know, which is the, the gains versus losses sort of perceptions. Um, but what you have to do is, I think, let, you, you have to take both the institutional structural you know, things that, that, that shape decision making and then blend that with the cognitive biases and then use that as a way to explain why it is we get the outcomes we get. Um, you're, you're not going to change the outcomes necessarily just by touching either the institutional features or the, con the, the cognitive biases. And, you know, I wonder just the, now I'm really getting crazy here, but it's late, is I wonder if our institutions sometimes just bake in our constitutional biases or our, our, our cognitive biases anyway. But that's a story for another day. Right, and I would piggyback on the yeah. on that a little bit and think about uh, some of Peter May's work and Tom's work and Desiree Crow's work and some of my work on social learning and social policy learning. So that's sort of like the the like the double loop of the learning process where a policy failure occurs and then policymakers and the people around them learn about the underlying causes of the problem to fundamentally understand the problem that that was revealed by the disaster or crisis in a way that it that didn't exist before. And so we think about sort of leveraging like deeper learning about, you know, structural inequities in society or, uh, or biases towards relief instead of preparedness or what really causes a pandemic. Um, those sorts of things um, may help uh, address those cognitive biases. Right, right. Deeper, deeper learning about uh, the underlying societal causes of a policy problem um, would be one way to get at that. So I know that you are all, so this is the last question for, we'll go around. Um, I know you are not uh, political prognosticators, you're political scientists, but I would be derelict if I didn't at least, because Rob raised it, that we are in an election year. And I had Julian Zelizer on and he gave, it was really good to talk to him about, about how he might advise a candidate in this climate, how do you how do you interpret COVID nineteen um, in the context of an election? So I'm not going to ask you to cut a commercial right now, but maybe we just quickly, as we close, ask each of you if you were advising anyone running for office this year, governor or or Joe Biden or Donald Trump uh, or your local mayor, how they can frame this to political advantage, who would you advise and what would you have them, what would you have them say? Rob, can would, you start? Sure. I, I would advise Joe Biden. And I would say that, Joe, this is an opportunity for you to close the gap with some of the left wing um, individuals in your, your own party by using the, the, the crisis um, to draw out some of those economic disparities that have been plaguing the country for a very long time. And I think this is a chance for him to show that he he understands um, how marginalized populations are disproportionately affected by this virus. I also think this is an opportunity for him to talk sincerely about climate change and other emerging hazards mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe he, he didn't emphasize enough uh, during the primary yeah. camp. Um, but I think that for him, the nature of this crisis could be a useful way for him to appeal to groups okay. that thus far have been reluctant to come over to Team Joe. Tom, what about you? Well, I'd advise Joe Biden and I would advise him. He's, he's got to start occupying more of the agenda space. I mean, it, you know, all, all the air is being consumed by the, the, the um, nightly uh, um, uh, the uh, task force briefings out of the White House. You know, in, in Vietnam, the five o'clock briefings were called the five o'clock follies. And I wondered if, if this might not be the, the time to bring that term back, but um, that might not be entirely fair because he's of course has you know, Dr. Fauci and other people that, that you know, or, yeah, and even Mike Pence to a considerable extent yeah. has, you know, been on message. Uh, but what I would advise Joe Biden, and what I would do is this, I mean, this is getting pretty far from what we talked about. Um, I would ask him to, to, you know, cut some more videos and, and just show what a compassionate, empathetic figure looks like in a time like this. The, I think one of the most jarring things about this current moment is that in a time when people look to and people 
at least since the Second World War, the Great Depression, have looked to the president, you know, fireside chats, things like that, have looked to the president, even uh, George W. Bush's speech after 9-11 was pretty effective, or some of the leadership of Rudy Giuliani, you know, after 9-11, you know, kind of giving people, you know, a little starch, you know, um, uh, invidious comparisons were kind of made between uh, Trump's speech to the nation and the queen in England, for example, about you know, her appealing to sort of the, the sort of the, the equanimity of the you know the British people um so I would say I would say you know model yourself you know behave as if you were president and say this is what I would do um in my fantasy of having a kitchen cabinet or a shadow cabinet of people that would say this is what we would do if we were president um draw that contrast between what you would do what could be done now and what is being done under this administration I think that would make for a very interesting approach in a time where you're not going to be able to hold campaign rallies. I hope Biden staff are listening. So that's two good pieces of advice. Kristen, you have the final word. Okay. Uh, I, so I get the benefit of going last. Um, if I were advising uh, Joe Biden, or if I were advising Gretchen Whitmer running for re-election or Mayor Duggan in the city of Detroit, I would If it's Whitmer, you may be advising the same ticket. I know that there's a distinct possibility of that. Um, but so what I would tell them is that the political science says that telling a story, telling a good narrative story about how a problem emerges and then sort of arcs and then is solved is really important to the public and how we consume political information and how they can shape our policy preferences. And all of our colleagues who study the narrative policy framework, so Liz Shanahan and Mike Jones and Mark Macbeth, they would all say like casting who the villain of the story is, is really important. Who the hero of the story of the pandemic is, is really important. And so if I were a campaign strategist, I would say, look, you can't tell people who have really suffered. You can't tell the general public who have really suffered, who have lost their jobs, who have just completely uprooted and changed their lives, you know, that they need to blame Donald Trump by, by, uh, by voting him out of office or, you know, or reelect me, um, uh, you need to invoke the hand of God. This was no one's fault. This was the hand of God that created this he, that this catastrophe. No one's to blame, but we can all get through it together because we are Detroiters, we are Michiganders, we are Americans, and I have the solution, right? I'm not casting blame, right? People don't like that kind of blame finger pointing politics, but they like to hear a solution. And so the solution is reviving the economy. The solution is getting life back to normal. The solution is being prepared so we never have to do this again. So if I were advising anyone, federal, state, local, that would be my thing. This was, this was, this was, a, this was an act of nature. This was the hand of God. And so, but my job as your fearless leader is to be the one that marshals us out of this. So. What a I want to remind everyone you've been listening to COVID calls and please join me tomorrow when we have Kathleen Tierney on to continue on some of these exact same, same themes. And I want to thank uh, the three panelists today, Kristen Taylor, Rob DeLeo, and Tom Berkland for sharing this hour with us and really taking us in depth on some uh, really complicated sort of theoretical uh, issues around federalism, around the way our government works, the way agendas are set after disasters. Thanks to all three of you so much. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. This is fun. We may need to have another session right around the time of the election. So I'll keep you on speed dial. Or, okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.